Hi, my name is Aaron Campbell, and we are Being Black Emory. And today's topic of conversation is respect building the black community. But before we jump into this conversation, I want to introduce our panelists. Danielle. So, my name is Danielle. I am a second year here at Emory. Hi, my name is Chad, second my third year. Hi, I'm Bobby. I'm a senior in the college. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I'm a first year. Hey, y'all, uh, I'm Cameron. I'm a first year. And I'm Sammy. This is my first year. Thank y'all for being here. So let's get right into the conversation. Do you think your socioeconomic status impacts your perception of the world and the people around you? Yes. Cammy, go for it. Um, I would say yes, just because like you only know what you grew up around. I mean that your perception can always change, but where it starts off is like it's always gonna have an impact on you, like your mental state, like what you've been through, like all that is important. Mm -hmm. So like if I could like figure back off of what you said, I think. For my social economic status, I wouldn't say my parents were in a bad position, but I went to a school where a lot of kids had a lower social economic status. And that taught me a lot because like one of my friends, his junior year in high school, he was homeless, but now he's at Dartmouth and he's like in the top of his class. So I've seen how people that have less can reach so high and do so many great things because of like that inspiration that they got from their, from their home environment. Well, in my opinion, I feel like it's more in spite of what they went through because for me as somebody who I guess like quote unquote comes from a low income socioeconomic background it has been very challenging dealing with people who just could never even fathom like basic issues that people are going to have to think about in terms of do I have money for housing do I have money to stay here each month I'm thinking about tuition um, no matter how much financial aid they give me it's still something I have to pay even just having a laptop at this school, I was speaking about that the other day, like you have to have a certain amount of money just to be able to do well in your classes. And in terms of being able to be successful, if you can't even do the basics, then how can you focus on what you need to do in school and every day? I'd say it affects me because it's like, like you come to a school like this, and like for me I had to leave like Memphis, right? So I came to Atlanta, and the way I perceive school is a little bit different because it's very different, like, the demographics are very different from the high school, the middle school I went to, like back home. So then, yes, I feel like it's gonna change me and. I think being at Emory, my socioeconomic status became a lot more apparent to me. Cause like, well, the neighborhood I grew up in, everybody was, you know, like single mom household, like everybody was kind of in the same boat. But then you come to Emory and you see people like parking with Porsches and you're just like, wow, like this is like crazy. Like people are just really living like totally different lives. And so I feel like at Emory, even talking to like some of my black friends, white friends, like whatever friends, I think it became a lot more apparent. Kind of what Danielle was saying, like just talking about like tech, like, well, I can buy this textbook now, but the other ones we gonna read in the second part of the semester, like I gotta wait till I get paid like down the road. I can't buy all my textbooks. I can't go to Barnes and Nobles. I don't go in there for nothing. <laughs> so it's just like, things, it's like, it's, it's things like that, that I feel like, have become more apparent since I've been at Emory. I would agree. I just feel like there are just a number of obstacles that kind of become like blinded if you have a certain economic status. Because I feel like, like me personally, I, I don't know, I feel like I've never, like my family has never like specifically like struggled, but I went to a kind of a high school that it was like very low income and like the culture was very different than when I came to Emory. And then I kind of saw like everybody just kind of like lived these perfect lives and nobody really had to worry about like economics or like being able to purchase a specific thing. Do you feel like Emory as an institution supports students from lower um, economic backgrounds? Quote unquote. <coughs> Experience. You know, I mean, they always talk about all the resources that are available, but from my personal experience, I know whenever I'm seeking out this help, I'm saying, okay, I'm having this issue. Um, I need help. They're saying, oh, go here, go there, go there. And people will like bounce me around campus trying to find like basic things, even like, for example, of uh, technology or textbooks. If I would have money for that, I'm just up the creek. Like, I don't know what to do about that. Like, that really is up to me. And it's either, you know, we have this help and come get it, or it's your responsibility. And professors are not going to understand, so. I'd have to disagree because, like, for me personally, like, I'm an aspiring business major. And I feel that, like, for black students, they do have, like, organizations put. You just have to, like, go out and get it. And you have to, like, go out and find these organizations, find these clubs. And then they're going to, like, help you, like, down that path. So I feel like I've gotten like adequate help. I've, I've gotten much more help than I thought I would like coming from high school. Like towards like, what do you want to do when you, like what do you want to do with your future? What do you want to major in that kind of thing? So I'd say like I've gotten 
adequate help so like i'm satisfied well kind of to your point if your institution if you have to go out and get everything or you always have to like finesse you always have to like find things on your own i feel like part of emory as an institution like it's your job to bring those things to me like i shouldn't always have to like figure out oh like this office like um community civic engagement like can help me do this or that like i as a student shouldn't have to have that like burden of always looking for things because other students don't you know other students from my socioeconomic status don't have to go through all of that i feel like like what you were saying like i shouldn't have to search for that like it should be somebody that's actually dedicated to helping me especially knowing like my socioeconomic status is considered to be so important here like why why am i not getting the help that i need all the time or like why is nobody checking in on me to make sure i'm getting the help that i need well, and everything what do you think I would like make you like what do you want from help when I say like help, I mean like if I ask a question, there's no way like you should not have the answer. Like it'll be times like I go somewhere to see if like somebody can help me and they'll be like, well, I don't know which department you should talk to. Or like they'll direct me to some general department, but the general department can't help me. I need specific help for that specific problem, mm -hmm. like stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even like in general, I feel like if you're not like the people like financially, like if you're the one that's supposed to be giving help, if you're if you have never experienced like that need, what you give is never going to be enough. I think. Yeah. So we talked about how your socioeconomic size can impact your perception. But let's move on more so to the workplace, right? Do y'all think that African American vernacular English is acceptable within the workplace or work environment? I don't think it's accepted. I think it should be, but it's not. Do you think it's acceptable? Oh, um, that's, I, I, that's think, I think that question is hard to answer because we've been conditioned to live in a society where we're forced to believe that straight hair is better. Plain English, quote unquote, is better. That these type of things are better. Like when you think of going to work, you have, okay, business casual, what you would wear, what you would say, you wouldn't chew gum. Like, so I think because we have that ingrained in our heads, it's hard for me to answer that question. And I, it might be hard for y'all too, but I feel like it should be accessible in the workplace. Do I think it is? Honestly, no, because I've, I don't want to, I've been in that environment growing up, as we probably all have, to believe that it's not appropriate. Mm, yeah. I don't want to speak for y'all, but like... I'm going to just have to absolutely like disagree. I just feel like, first of all, like African American vernacular like English, it's not like... How should I put this? It's not like in the repertoire to use it in the workplace. It's something that's really spoken at home. It's not like something you can write down. Like you don't really write down the way you say different words in like Ebonics versus how you write them down in plain English. So I just feel like it's not something that you could even like begin to use in the workplace like formally and it's also not accessible to people who do not speak it as well because like, there's like a generalized like yeah. lingua franca for a reason because like when i say that i mean i don't mean that like it should be used i'm saying that we should not have to change who we are like as in be somewhere we're not would i say it's appropriate probably not but when i said that i meant as in we, would, we shouldn't have to switch up when other people don't i, mean, I don't I think, think changing the way you speak that. changes who you are on the inside right but i'm all. saying like in saying that like do you think, like, because other people got to change the way they speak too? Like, I feel like everybody to a certain extent has to code switch, no matter whether you black yeah, or not. Yeah, like, no matter what you saying, like, I just feel like, in my opinion, it's not appropriate for the workplace simply because, like, you, you're not finna just talk to your boss any type of way. Like, you're not gonna talk to them like you talk to your friends. Right. Just like the same way you wouldn't talk to your mama like how you talk to your friends. Like, I'm not finna go home and cuss at my mama. But, like, especially if it's my job and that's a professional workplace, I'm like, I'm gonna talk appropriately. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I, think that, oh, sorry. Okay. You know. I think that anything that could impede what I'm trying to, like, communicationally, what I'm trying to say to you, I stray away from. So, like, for instance, there's, like, vernacular that I use being from Texas that other black people don't use up north. So, like, ho. I'm, yeah. yeah, like, we use <laughs> ho for, like, everything. So, like, I'm not about to, you know, like, sit here and keep having conversations with you with the vernacular I learned from Texas because you're just not going to understand me. And so, like, the same in the workplace. Like, if you are not understanding what I'm trying to get you to understand if that's an assignment, if that's a project, if I'm doing a presentation, if it's getting in the way of you not understanding, like, I'm okay with being like, okay, like, I'm just not going to use that word. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna switch it up because at the end of the day like I need to get my check and so if that is impeding that is that, I gotta get my bag so like I'm gonna finesse to get my bag I think it's kind of like finding a median between authenticity and almost like assimilation like I'm gonna be real because it, it kind of depends on where you are when you're bringing up code switching for example um, at my job I work as a tutor and a lot of times you know I have to 
basically proofread people's papers and say like, oh, something's wrong with this, something's wrong with that. But actually, in our personal training, like they've said, if they want to use like AAVE on their own, like we're not supposed to say you can't do that because it's le it's a legitimate language. Like if somebody wants to use that, they can choose to use that. Wait, now, what's AAVE? African American Vernacular English. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool, child. I just I, I, I can't be saying the whole thing. <laughs> but um, in my opinion, I feel like for me, I'll admit I was kind of grown like. With, when I grew up, it was kind of just put into me that I had to speak a certain way. Like, mm -hmm. I was from Louisiana, and we all kind of had an accent. Well, as I grew up, like, my accent really just faded away because I was always in white spaces. Or even though I was in a black space, my parents put the idea into me that, like, oh, if you speak a certain way, people will treat you a certain way. Yeah. And that's not right. That's why I completely disagree with choosing to um, or being forced to code switch depending on where you are. I understand you can have the choice to do it if you want to, if you want to use that to benefit you. But nobody's going to tell me what I'm going to say, where I want to say it. Um, now, will I face the consequences of that action? Yeah, but like that's my own, my own way. Yeah. I feel like okay. I feel like it can be like used in the workplace, but as a general like rule, it shouldn't be used because, I mean, you also have people that don't have English as their first language, and then the way they're learning English is different than the way we speak to our friends, we speak to our homies. So it's kind of like. If you want to have like a level playing field and you want to be able to reach more people, then the English that we learn like in school is the one that should be spoken to communicate to everybody. I low key feel like that upholds white supremacy because they create this, you know, that's their their version of English and that's what we're supposed to say. Yeah, but speak. you're not gonna like. They don't speak it right. I, I don't know. I, I don't consider that to be. There is no one form. Like, there is no official language on like that. I have to follow. Or anybody has to follow. If somebody is coming to America to learn a language, like I understand that. But I'm not really sure if that would constitute me being forced to use. Um, Plain English. Or but when I like called. say it in the well, considering they starting to learn English, like why not use it in a in a use English in a way in which they would understand? Like, cause right. I get Sammy point. Like, not saying that you have to be forced to do anything. Cause honestly, you ain't got to do shit but stay black and die. But at the end of the day, like if somebody is like trying to learn this or trying to understand you, why not speak in the way in which they would understand you the best? Like, but do y'all yeah. see that like? The idea of what's the acceptable form of English or the most normalized form of English is the version that these people have created. And to be honest, even the conversation, like most people will consider AAVE to be inferior in some way for whatever reason. It's like, oh, we shouldn't use this, we shouldn't say this, but why shouldn't we say it? What's wrong with it? Like, what really is wrong with it besides the fact that most people don't use it? Most people aren't black. Yeah, that's well, what I'm saying. There, I don't think there's nothing wrong with like using it to your homies. But y'all said we should we shouldn't use it in the workplace. I don't and I don't think, I don't think you should because in the workplace you're gonna have to you're not gonna reach people all the time who speak the same type of English as you if that's how you're gonna communicate. Right. But if you wanna reach more people, if you wanna have greater influence to like more people outside of America and like beyond, then I think it'd just be better to stick to like the way that they learned growing up, the way that we like the way that it's taught in most schools. But that's then that's going into, like, why do black people always have to change? Like, why do we have to change the way we talk in order to, like, accommodate for it? Like, why they can't, you know, like, we are always the ones who have to, like, maneuver and, like, change what we, who we are, how we, like, all those different things in order to, like, everybody else to feel okay. Like, why is that? Why does that always have to be the case? But, but like, like oh, oh, um, go ahead. I feel like if you compare, like, I agree with you, you're saying, like, if you compare AAVE to, like, a southern accent, if you come and you talk about some darling and, like, slurring all your words, that's the cutest thing in the world. There's no problem with that. I promise any workplace you go into, they're not going to tell you to, can you not have that southern accent, please? You'll never hear that. But if I'm from the D.C. area or in Texas or Louisiana and I'm black and I have I speak AAVE, that's the issue. Why? Like, what's the difference? Like, both of them are different forms of English, but one is accepted because it comes from one group of people. Mm -hmm. So my problem with this is, like, it's just like AAVE, natural hair, having dark skin that they might say had clashes with whatever. To me, that's all in the same category. So, like, we talk to think that's professional? No, but why not? If different types of English, like Southern accents, are acceptable. No, I just feel like there's kind of a difference between accents, dialects, and AAVE, because like AAV, if theoretically, it's kind of its own language, and the fact that like, if you were to drop a white person into a black neighborhood, they would not, or to, into a black neighborhood that happens to speak Ebonics, they would not understand what's going on. Like when I came here, there were like, a no, there would be a number of times where I would like <laughs> say something, and people would just be like, 
what? Like, like, what do you even it. say? It and don't just, matter no more. Right, and I would just be like, forget it because you don't understand what I'm saying because it kind of is its own language. So I feel like in terms of like having an accent versus a dialect versus like AAVE, like those are three completely different things that I feel like we have to like distinguish because everybody speaks with an accent. Like if I'm from Chicago, I might have a, a Chicago accent. If I'm from the West Coast, I might have a Cali accent. It might be like, yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> like and all that stuff like that. And it's just like, that is different than AAVE. But because white people like, do not understand what black people are saying. And would you say times. that? Go they, ahead. they don't, like at all. <laughs> okay, well actually, let's be real. Um, one thing about it, especially with like hip hop slash rap being number one genre, mm -hmm. white people know what these words are. I, 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 no, no, but they don't. In, no, in they my opinion, they may use A A V E wrong, but they know what the fuck I'm talking about when I say I'm gonna go there. Like I'm gonna do this, whatever, whatever. Like I don't feel as if it's completely lost upon them, or they just can't conceive something. So when you bring up the point of like, oh, I need to make sure people can understand what I'm saying, they understand what I'm saying, but they feel like what I'm saying is being said in an inferior way. They're not okay with how I'm saying it. My That's question like, to you okay. is, how would you feel if like a white person, like you saying like it's not appropriate for the workplace or that it is appropriate for the workplace, like how would you feel if a white person came up to you and was like, oh, like, hey girl, like what's up sis? Like, they're not African American. Exactly. So, so like, I get what y'all saying with this whole like, oh, it is appropriate versus it isn't appropriate. But why would you consider that appropriate for the workplace? Like, I get like people had their reasons of why it is not Jeez, let me get my words together. Why it's not appropriate for the workplace, but why would you think that is like? Because it's my language. Like, if, if I speak something naturally, then why should I have to so change it you... based based on it being considered inferior? Mm -hmm. If there's if there's a, like a legitimate basis where it's like, okay, this is something that's not actually a language or something that um, offends people in like a, I, to be honest, I, I I actually don't even agree. Like, fuck, you're not gonna make me say anything. So I was trying to think mm -hmm. of the opposite, the opposite direction, but if y'all have it, you bring it up because I can't even think of it. I was just say they still don't know what the hell they're saying. They like, don't know what the fuck they'll they're say saying. these words, they'll sing along, and they'll like. But then you can ask them, oh, what does that mean? Or they'll string along these like sentences. Hey, sis, gang, what up? Okay, phone them and all that stuff. Like, don't I've, know literally, shit. I've literally heard people in the library like talking on the phone, like saying stuff like that, saying it to be funny, to be cute. When in reality, it's like somebody else's language that they're kind of appropriating, mm -hmm. and it's like they don't know what this means. If you were to ask them, what are you saying? They like, wouldn't know. I feel like if they wanted to understand, they could, but they choose not to. It's like if you want to learn another language, you can. But Damn. but how would y'all like, feel comfortable having white people learn? No, it's not like that I, language. Like exactly. we, we, we don't want them to keep using it. They just want. I I wish that they could recognize that when we use it, understand what we're saying. Does that make sense? Mm. Like, I'm not saying I want them to take it on themselves, but like recognize and understand that that's something that I do. And because I. Do y'all think that if white people were to use A A V E, would it then become more respectable and acceptable yeah. in the workplace? Yeah. Um, no, no. no. Yeah. Actually, I think that if white people were using A A V E as much as they wanted to, I'm sure uh, our framing of the idea of it being respectable would probably be changed. I'm sure it'd be okay to use it if the normal majority is, you know, the ones people, the people who are using the language. Mm. Now. Yeah, that's it. That. That's like the problem I have with this is that if white people decided to use AEVE, I pro it would automatically be acceptable. Every not maybe not everywhere, but like it would be much more accepted than it is now because white people are doing it. No, it wouldn't. Well, like the word, right. okay, no. eat, that's what I'm saying, no brand names, like, yeah. You disagree? I get what you're saying. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I do disagree. Um, I just feel like because once white people use it, there will be, like, a codified set of, like, rules and laws that come along with it. They'll, they'll like, enforce some type of grammar upon it or, like, some random shit, and then it's like, oh, this, you're speaking Ebonics incorrectly. It'll be a white person telling you, you speak Ebonics incorrectly. <laughs> you're using, you're using something <laughs> wrong. What are you talking about? So I just feel like once they have the power to kind of legalize or to kind of, like, codify all these specific rules and norms around the language, then it won't be black people's anymore. Mm, well, I feel like all. white people have already started to take a lot of language from, okay, even um, the black gay community. Like, cis, all, all of these things people use on, on Twitter, I mean, they're taking language from black queer people. And at this point, you know, they're making it what they want it to be. Like, it is what it is. And now people are like, oh, well, look look at my sis. Um, some, 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 all this other bullshit. And it's like, oh, T. Right. And they're like, oh, well, it's just me expressing myself. Well, where'd you get that form of expression mm. from? You know what I mean? So I feel like once they have that agency or once they have that, that power, they make it their own, they take it. So we talked about how language can be respectable or not respectable in the workplace. But what about what you wear every day? Do you think what you wear says something about your values as a black person or a black Personally, like I've always been taught that like 
98% of what people think of you when they first see you is your appearance. Like, it's what you're wearing. So, of course, like, I'm automatically going to say yes just because, like, first, in my opinion, first impressions count. Like, even though you do want to know, like, the... You want to know a person besides, like, what you see in front of them. But, like, if I see you on the street and I see you dressed in type of way, I'm going to be, like, like why you either you look nice or, like, why, why you come out of the house looking like that. But that's just me. Like, that's what I've been taught. So, yeah. Like, yeah. I think how you dress is, like, it says a lot about who you are because that's, like, the primary way in, like, which, in which you express your personality, like, and your opinions and, and opinions and stuff. So I feel like, especially if you're, like, like you said, like, if you're looking disheveled, if you're looking dirty, that says a lot about how you value yourself. Like, self-respect. But, self like, but, but, but what what's the standard? Access? Yeah, I'm, like, I'm you're saying dirty, dirty, you're looking this way, but it's like, I, not everybody has access to be able to be clean all the time. Yeah, not, <laughs> I didn't take a shower last night, so, I mean, <laughs> like, I... And that definitely is something to consider, because I definitely walk around this campus majority of the time looking at all this with sweats and stuff on. But, like, I get what y'all are saying, like... Like, when I say disheveled, I mean as in, like, Physically, like not hygienic, like as in crossing your eyes, not being. No, that's girl, I know exactly about. what you mean, but I'm okay. saying I disagree because some people cannot afford to walk around. You know, I took a shower, I was able to make sure that like, I'm looking okay. If I'm worried about, you know, say it is making some money or getting to the next bill, I might not be concerned with like, oh, is my face looking okay? Is my body looking okay? I'm, now, that's true. Oh, but I, I disagree because I feel like. Even it, like I feel like anyone has access to a public restroom to check in the mirror, look in your eyes, wipe your face with some water. I feel like everybody can do that. Wait, how are you going to determine access for everyone though? Like, when what's I the say, gauge? You are, I should I should generalize and say everybody, but I feel like no matter what's going on in your life, it's important to present yourself a certain way because that's how people perceive you. Mm. But I feel like for black people, like. I don't care what I have. Like they're gonna see my blackness before they see it. Like they're gonna ju they're gonna be like, there go that girl with the nappy. Like, like that's it. Like yeah. I don't care if I got you know the pantsuit on to the you can't see my ink. Like I'm the black girl, period. And so I feel like that the whole first impressions argument goes out the window for black people. And at least from my experiences, like I feel like that kind of goes out the window. That, well, I think it depends mm -hmm. on on how you're representing your blackness. Because if I were to come in and I had my hair straightened and you know, um, I, I wore something to cover my body, something like that, if I'm able to make myself as close to whiteness as possible, I think there's a different level of respectability that um, is connected to how you present yourself. So if you're presenting yourself as the most black version of what you could look like, um, there's gonna be a different level of treatment. But I still think in that Period. case, like, your the compliments you get like the uh, like anything it's still gonna be like for a black girl like for like even if I when I wore my hair straight like even when I it was like oh you're smart for a black girl oh you did this really like it's still like the blackness can never like That's even true. if I like go by the rules of a whiteness says it's beautiful and like all those kinds of things like I still think the blackness is so attached which I mean I love it because I love to be black but it's so attached and entrenched in the way like other people think like no matter if I ain't got no clothes on if I got all the clothes on well, I feel like overall it's based on the standards. So, yeah, we're talking about between black and white people are going to be basing it on the white standard of whatever is considered normal. But even in the black community, if you don't have a certain look or if you're not fitting the idea of what's going to be normal here, you know, people are going to look at you weird. That's weird. Okay, but regardless of how you dress, that, is, that wouldn't necessarily determine, like, what kind of values you have, what kind of human being you, like, aspire to be. Mm. So I, I didn't say I don't, all that. I'm just, I'm just I know, but like, he asked about values, so I'm just yeah. saying, like... That wouldn't necessarily like determine like what you believe, your morals, anything like that. I but think I the problem like, is. Go ahead, Chad. I just feel like you do dress for what you want, and you dress to kind of present yourself in a certain way in order to give off this like vibe of like what, or, like oh I'm smart, or oh I go out and I wear this in order to like look good or to look cute, and like that's what you value at that specific moment because that's what you chose to wear. And I feel like just to disregard what people wear is like a choice to act to actively like ignore their personalities. And I feel like that's not good, especially when it comes to like black people who, I guess put a lot of work into looking a specific way that they look like, put a lot of work into our hair and things like that. I feel like ignoring that is like bad too. And that's, yeah. a, that's a good point. Um, but what Bobby mentioned earlier about her blackness is always something they've always see. And so let's talk about colorism, right? And what shades of blackness has more value or more respectable value? What do y'all think about that? 
Oh, well, as a light, well, I identify myself as a light skinned woman. <laughs> I definitely get more privileges than my dark skinned friends, and I see it every day. I see it in the men that approach us and how they approach us. I see it in, especially like when I used to wear my hair straight and just like the like passing or whatever, like you know, like just being like close to whiteness. Mm -hmm. Like I, you, I don't know. I can see. I know some light light skinned women don't believe that, but I see it. So like I completely agree. Like, and I feel like when you're dark skinned. All the movements that we have now, like the natural hair movement, the dark, that's not, we wouldn't call it the dark skin movement. The, the, melanin, <laughs> movement. the melanin movement. The yeah, melanin movement. Right, but like black appreciation, black appreciation, right. <laughs> Why'd you say that with angst though? Like, 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 yes. like, like things like that, those come from because we were taught to hate ourselves for so to hate ourselves for so many years, we needed that. But I hate that, like you said, now it's becoming a trend. So I think on social media, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, dark skin girls, black is beautiful, da da da. But when you get out to the real world, all that shit fake. It's, bro. Yeah, it's, I feel like the energy is well. yes. the same. When I'm mm -hmm. going around to like Atlanta clubs, for example, depending on what weave I have in, I'm gonna get treated differently. If I can Ooh. get something wet and wavy, oh yeah, you look a you look a little foreign, you look a little exotic. I'm not fucking foreign. I'm not exotic. Like I'm really, I am white. Like, I'm from right here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just feel like there's a lot of politics and of course colorism around what we think is you know the ideal depending on what the situation is mm -hmm. so yeah you know on social media we love dark-skinned women but do we love dark-skinned women in our home yeah. so we're at Emory right you're all in the higher education but do you think all black people can benefit from higher education yes I just feel like school life for everybody. And mm -hmm. I say that like with the most confidence. There's some people that I know that's prospering now that did not go to school at all, like didn't go to college. Some people I know didn't even finish high school and like are doing well in life. Like school, in my opinion, is not made for everybody. Yes, of course, it sounds nice to say everybody will benefit from higher education, but how so when even getting a higher education doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get a job. It don't necessarily mm -hmm. mean people gonna like you more. Like it just, I feel like it depends on the person and what you're trying to accomplish getting that higher education. If everyone wants to pursue higher education, then there's going to be so many other things that's... There's going to be so many other jobs like plumbers and the like that aren't going to be met. So that's why not every black person should pursue higher education. It's just not... I, I, just I think not. every... Uh, yeah. no, no, no. no, no. Hey, somebody got to be low no, no, for us to be no, high. No, no. I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't think you really Calm meant down. that. I, I think I, so yeah, I don't think you say, meant it in that way. You, you ain't mean that. You ain't no, mean I just, down, I just down. feel like I meet so many service workers, even at Emory, who are like black people who didn't get an education or they, they didn't get like a higher level of education because they didn't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I feel as though like, I really wish every black person really had that opportunity or would at least take advantage of that opportunity because it really disproportionately forces black people to take low income jobs, taking like service jobs or like seeing like, or let's them like working in like a house, like somebody's like house or something. And I feel like, when I came to the South, I really noticed it a lot because in Chicago, like everybody, mm -hmm. like the region I'm from, like everybody is like black. So even if you're high income, low income, you you're from? still black. The South Side. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you were about to say from out west. I was about to be like, disown. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. Um, <laughs> yes. But when I came here, I really noticed the high amount of black people that work for white people. And I really do not like that. I, don't I feel like, like that. the level of education that you have does like really impact what you can like achieve in life. Because I feel like a white person working that same service job would be seen as like a failure of a white person before a black person. I don't think like it should be a prized thing to have a service job. That's yeah, just like, me. <laughs> low key, I get what you're saying with the whole like a feel like they seen as like damn you didn't. Cause I'm not gonna lie, I sometimes be feeling like like dang you didn't you didn't secure the bag like you, you had got, all you that have, you got this privilege. whole step up and you years. just come on now. But like it shouldn't be that way. And I do yeah. get what you're saying with the whole cause that was my first thing. Like I got here and was like let me look for black people and everywhere they was is where I like was the, behind the, the counter. Right like, behind the, exactly. And like it's it's warm and it's welcoming, but at the same time I would love to see that in my classroom. Like I would love to see more black professors. I would love like that's something. But like, I don't know. It's just, that's a sticky subject to me. Cause. Like, at least for me, like, I'm from PG County, Maryland, you know. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Where's that? <laughs> what I said? <laughs> Prince, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's Prince George's County, Maryland. It's the richest oh, black Prince county George. in the nation. Oh, oh okay. Like, yes. You better put some respect <laughs> on it. Just, just saying. Just saying. <laughs> I ain't saw that. No. Anyway, so, like, so I... I so like what I was saying about um, being from Prince George's County, Maryland, that's the richest black county in the in the nation. So everyone in that county, I don't say everyone, a big percentage of the people that live there are black. So I went to school, all my teachers were black, our um, 
every literally every service worker, janitor, teacher, professor in the universities, uh, presidents of organization clubs, everything was held by a black person. Go to the bank, manager's black. Go to the grocery store, manager's black. Wherever you went, literally everywhere. Y'all get the point. That sounds amazing. Right. So I so <laughs> yes. growing up, that was a big representation thing for me because I never had to think, well, I can't be a professor because I don't see anybody that looks like me. I don't I never had that. So I come here. And I'm around all these people that I lived in an all white world all their lives. And of course we do too, like I did too, living in that county. But I had that representation of living and seeing black excellence every day. Mm -hmm. And I took that for granted because I come here and every black person like we say is behind the counter. That's a good, that's a good point to end on. Right. Thank you for having this conversation. Um, the last thing we're gonna do is just give your final thoughts about respectability politics in the black community. Danielle? Um, overall, what I will say is you cannot run from blackness because, mm. uh, you know, it's always going to be there. Don't forget who you are because we can see right through it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I would say respectability politics is like a way that black people have kind of like tried to mold their own survival in white spaces. And it's been useful in some regards, but in some regards it's failed. And I feel like us being at Emory is like, it's not an instance of being respectable. I feel like some people don't really have to change themselves to like fit in here, but other people do. And we have to kind of acknowledge that fact. Yeah, um, blackness is not a monolith. Like we all have different experiences, different ways of being. And so if you choose to participate in respectability politics and that's just how you are, then that's the truth. But you should never feel like you have to police somebody <laughs> into um, partaking of respectability politics either. Mm. At least for me, on my campus, I'm 4%, and I came from somewhere where I was 99%. So in Emory's environment, I really do see the, necess the, oh my gosh, the necessity of respectability politics. So I feel like it's definitely something that we should take seriously and keep continue to have these conversations about. Um, personally, I just think that, like, like you said, you can't you can't hide your blackness. Like it's just something you have to accept. Accept that everybody is different. Everybody comes from different backgrounds. Like what you choose to do with it, it's up to you. And obviously, like black people aren't treated the same as other races, like nationwide. So it's more of a thing. Like if we don't, if we keep these discussions, then maybe that can change. But until then, it's like we just have to make the best out of our situation. Mm -hmm. Snaps. Nice. Snap. Give a round of applause <laughs> to everybody. Yes. Oh, snap. Yes, darling. That concludes Go our first episode black. of Being oh. Black and Murray. Ooh. That was too cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Beauty Black. Yes. Right. Ooh. Where are you guys going? It's that guy. What do you actually mean? That was good. That was so good. Move on. Move on.